going to continue this conversation around cities and what do cities mean in our future. And to give us more of a view of that, we've got a great panel who's going to come on up on stage and share their vision for the future of cities. So this is going to be led by Emily, who is a writer at the New York Times and also spending a year here in Boston um, doing a Neiman Fellowship at Harvard. So Emily, I will let you introduce your panel. Come on up on stage. You're welcome. Have, um So welcome, everybody. Um, I, I just downloaded um, New York City's 311 um, smartphone app, so now I can um, report a rat sighting or I can um, make a complaint about a construction noise um, or a taxi driver. Um, you know, technology is, is changing the way that we interact with our government. It's changing the way that um, our, it's changing our transportation systems, it's changing our policing systems, our, our health systems. Um, in New Orleans, the fire department is using machine learning to predict and figure out which homes need smoke detectors. Um, technology and data are literally saving lives, but there are a lot of unknowns ahead. Um, security, um, privacy, and issues of inclusion and access loom large in these conversations. Um, my name is Emily Rube, and I'm a reporter at the New York Times, and I've been digging into the guts of New York City to try and understand how it works. Um, and sometimes I'm pretty amazed that it works at all. Um, but here today we have three innovators and practitioners who are thinking about the guts of the city 50 years from now, um, and which is increasingly important work as more and more people move into cities. Um, we have to my left Kyle Corkum, who is a Massachusetts native and the CEO of L Star Ventures, which is a private real estate investment company, and they have built everything from marinas to malls uh, to housing developments, um, but his latest project is here in Boston, about 12 miles south of the city in South Weymouth called Union Point, and Kyle is very optimistic about the future of smart cities. And I'll let him tell you about it, but he has big ambitious plans to transform a naval air base into a smart city. Uh, we have Steve Goldsmith, um, who brings with him about three decades of experience in government. He's the former mayor of Indianapolis, a former deputy mayor of New York City. Um, he is uh, the director of innovations in government program at Harvard's Kennedy School leads several initiatives, including one called Data Smart City Solutions, which is telling the stories about how government agents and leaders are using technology to solve problems. Um, he spends a lot of time traveling and writing about uh, cities, and his next book is coming out in November um, called A New City OS, about the power uh, of collaborative and distributed governance. And we have Ann, uh, Aaron Baumgartner, uh, who is the assistant director at MIT Sensible Cities Lab um, down the road um, at MIT. And she, they're doing very, very innovative work um, using machine, uh, using um, big data and the internet of things to study how digital technologies are changing the way that people live in cities and how technology is changing the way we live. And Aaron's job is to connect 
this multidisciplinary lab with partners around the world, universities and cities and corporations to um, execute these projects. They've worked with the city of Amsterdam uh, to study autonomous boats. They have also worked with Uber to study the future of ride sharing and the potential for it to impact traffic and pollution and, and energy consumption. So they have a lot of hard-earned knowledge that they're here to share with us. So we have smartphones, smartwatches, and now smart cities. What is a smart city? Uh, Aaron, the lab doesn't, prefers not to use that term. What is a smart city to you? Well, I think that increasingly the term is so overused that it's nearly meaningless, right? Smart in what way, right? There's no such thing as the perfect smart city. The problems that are facing our urban environments and our rural environments are so complex and multifaceted that nobody's really getting it right. Right? Nobody's hitting home runs on health, transportation, environment, inclusivity, et cetera, et cetera. Certain cities around the world are leading in various aspects, but nobody's uh, pushing it across the goal line on every uh, one of the topics. I'd like to take two issues with the word smart cities. The first of which is that it assumes that every issue we're facing can be solved with technology, just like a just add tech answer. Whereas we all know that a lot of the issues that we're facing are, are not solved by sensors. Think about children going to bed hungry. That is not something that's going to be solved through IoT solutions. The second uh, issue I'd like to take with it is just determining things as smart cities. I think it could be preferable to think about smart communities. As we saw with the last election cycle in the United States, there became a very big divide with people in non-urban environments feeling as if they'd been left behind by the urban ones. So we can't assume that the solutions that are being driven are just gonna be for folks living in New York, Boston, Chicago, Singapore, et cetera. Yep, that's uh, all great points. Um, Kyle, you're building one um, at Union Point. Uh, what is going to make your city so smart? Well, I, I, I don't, I would say being a smart city is not our top priority. Expanding the definition of a smart city, if that's the way to do this, Aaron and I have talked about this, uh, is a priority to us. So the, the usual things that smart cities that have been built around the world uh, have aspired to do tend to start with technology. That seems to be a driving focus. Uh, they, they focus on sustainability and they look at systems and they look for efficiencies and and that's all admirable, and then beautiful built environments, great architecture, streetscapes. But we feel that on our investigation of this, that where smart cities fall short are, are on, on the soft side of this, so the human elements. So we think you know, using Boston as our inspiration, because Union Point is only 12, 12 miles south of where we are right here. Uh, and so we need to relate to our city, and what we do here may not relate to Rio, it may not relate to Seoul, but it will matter because it's relevant locally. And so in our case, Boston is a very strong arts culture. So we think arts and humanities is a really important part of a city. We think education, Boston has the finest, you know, uh, graduate and postgraduate education in the world. Uh, there's a tremendous network. We think that needs to be part of a city. And then there's inclusivity. Boston is a very diverse city. We think our smart city should likewise be diverse. And so. We're focused on those other three human elements and making those as, as high a priority as technology, sustainability, and architecture. Steve, in your book, The Responsive City, um, you just describe how we're living in this moment of tremendous opportunity for city governments. Um, it's the most important moment in about 100 years to fundamentally change the ways that government operates. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, I think it's a very exciting time. Um, so I picked a century kind of randomly, in part because a century plus ago, uh, we came out of Tammany Hall. We created a system of accountability for cities that was rule-driven, right? 
you hierarchies and command and control and the definition of accountability as you follow the rules. So now, uh, 100 plus years later, uh, we have the tools to measure outcomes as a definition of accountability. We have the tools to make public employees smarter in the way they do their job. And so if we really take advantage of today's technologies to change the way government works, we can make more effective decisions, we can identify outliers, we can solve problems, we can be more responsive to the needs of citizens. We've, we can change this idea that you can't give public employees discretion because they'll abuse the discretion to one that says we'll help inform them in the use of their discretion and then we'll measure the results. Very important moment in time in kind of public administration. Totally agree, especially as I walk around with my smartphone, my, my 311 app. Um, but there, there are real concerns about uh, inequality and that, that some of these technological investments are not going to benefit everyone. You know, you have, not everybody has a smartphone, not everybody has access to reliable internet, you have uh, generational um, differences. As, as you meet with these chief data officers and, and mayors and the decision makers who are on the front lines of these changes or these decisions, how, how do you see them confronting this or, or handling these, these challenges? Right, I mean, so it's no great surprise that millennials uh, are more data fluent than others. So then you say, well, will these tools make us less equitable? You know, when I was deputy mayor of New York City and 311, uh, were, I worked with 311, we got 20 to 30 million calls a year. I don't think those calls were necessarily evenly distributed all over all ethnicities, right? There are people who know how to game the system, there are people more articulate, et cetera. So the question now, I think, is how do we use the tools to actually create equity? And there's a range of ways you can do that. One is we can now visualize what happens in a city much more effectively. I mean, there's a, a map that we use on our site at uh, Kennedy School that shows wealth divides in the Bay Area and San Francisco by neighborhood, by zip code, right? Uh, the city of uh, Los Angeles and Mayor Garcetti used mapping to show the distribution of public services block by block. How long did it take you to get your trash problem resolved if you lived in block one versus block two? So, so we can now see inequities. So it doesn't make people uh, inherently more or less uh, unequal in the term in the in the eyes of the public official. It gives the public official opportunities. And lastly, um, and I think inherent in the in all th uh, comments of all three of us. So you can reach out to communities, right? You don't have to wait for a tech-savvy person to do it. And you could, uh, there are different nonprofit providers uh, texting in Philadelphia. Let's ask a, a person who has a workforce voucher or whose son or daughter is in an after-school program. Text us back what you thought. Don't even have to have a smartphone. Text us back. And then one of the things that uh, uh, enlightened developers are doing, including the city of New York, is um, providing free gigabit wireless throughout the city, right? So most people have smartphones, it's just they don't have, they can't afford the data plan. So what's the responsibility of the city to reach out to folks who are not well served? So, uh, yeah, I agree entirely. There, there are other perspectives too. So the, the standard that we use as we design our city is how does this technology or this architectural design or the sustainability concept, how does it enhance the human experience, right? So the standard that we're living by is if we have autonomous vehicles, for example, then let's make sure that the autonomous vehicles aren't just there because it's the next cool thing in transportation. Let's create mobility opportunities for someone who's handicapped, right? So we have a test subject that we're working with right now, a woman who's 75 who's never had a license, and we're working with an autonomous vehicle company to, to learn how someone like that that has almost no background in tech at all can use that autonomous vehicle to get mobility that she needs to live her life. Or if we have a blind person that lives in the community and we have a very strong focus on art, how can we use technology to help that sightless person experience art on a deeper level, right? For example, uh, there are smartphone apps that are being developed where you can hold the smartphone up and it will describe what's in front of you. You know, it might describe that there's a statue there, but it doesn't tell you anything about the statue. And so what we'd want to do is experiment with ways to unlock the potential of that phone 
to have a narration about that that describes the artist and what his intent was and describe it in, in detail so that we unlock the art world to some a sightless person. So we're looking at technology that way as does it enhance our residents, our guests? If it doesn't, we set it aside and we focus on those, um, those technologies that serve those ideals. If I may, I think, ooh, sorry guys, everybody awake? I good. Uh, I think that what everybody's talking about is that whatever our plan is for cities or for uh, communities and environments is that the key is that the citizen be at the nucleus, right? The citizen be at the very center of the equation. As we start planning things that are these top-down solutions, like here, take this, it's good for you. Like that doesn't work. Whenever people are asking uh, folks who are in industry or academia, what is a smart city? Well, the answer should be turn around and ask the audience because these are the folks that have to live in it, right? You are the people who know what a smart city is to you because you are the folks who know what you need. So I think part and parcel to what Steve was saying is that having governments who can make solutions which are transferable is essential, but also giving people the tools and access to data that allows them to sort of chart their own path forward and uh, sort of tweak and redefine solutions that fit them and their daily needs. Yeah, no, I, I, now at the center of all of this is the citizen, um, and there is an interchange between the information that is being given by the citizen to participate in this um, smart community. And, you know, as I, as I walk around and I, and I see sensors and I, and I think about uh, security cameras, um, I think there's a lot of concern about how this data is, is going to be used and for what, what purposes. Um, and, you know, you, Aaron, work with um, stakeholders in many nations, each of which has its own idea of what privacy means and, and policies and laws governing the use of this information. How, how do you convene these conversations? Sure, I think that the most important thing is to be thinking about communicating what you're doing and why. We're noticing that increasingly the public is very, very scared about their data, about being observed, about that data being analyzed and its results being shared. And I think that some of the fault in that lies in us as the researchers or as the industry or as the city officials who are doing it because we're not necessarily doing yet the best job that explains here's what we're doing with this data, here's how it's being stored, here's how it's being analyzed, and most importantly, here's the benefit, right? This is how this will improve your life, or this is how we're hoping it will. Now, these questions about privacy that everybody is all hyped up about, it's interesting to me because your privacy is sort of gone already, right? If you have a smartphone or a credit card or you take public transportation, like you have an email account, like your privacy, you're willingly giving it up in many ways. If for some reason you're one of the folks in the audience that doesn't have a credit card or an email address, you've never used social media or a telephone, then rest assured, maybe your privacy is somewhat intact. And it's an oversimplification, of course. But the reason that you know that it's gonna take you 20 minutes to get to work on Google Maps versus 18 yesterday is because they're following you. And you've let them because it's convenient. You've given up that up because you're getting a benefit in return. And you know what that benefit is, and it's measurable. So it's our job, as we're doing these sort of living labs and implementations of our research in cities, to explain what are we doing? What are we hoping to get out of this? So that we're bringing the public in at the bottom floor versus, again, that top-down thing that says, here's what we did, we hope you're okay with it. Yeah, Steve, how do you do that um, you know, at, at the city level, um, especially as, you know, the privacy laws in our country are lag behind the technology? Um, how do you engage citizens in this, in this discussion? There, you have privacy issues on, on IoT data, you have privacy issues on cities' internal data, I mean, there's lots of questions, and many, most cities are still kind of feeling their way through this. Uh, Seattle and San Francisco 
I see Nigel, one of the one of the country's leaders here from Boston is in the second row. So every time I compliment a city, I'm just going to throw Boston in. So because Boston, San Francisco, and Seattle are leaders in this in this regard. So I think there's um, a couple ways to think about it. One is um, publish. Think about the privacy and security issues. Publish what you're going to do as a city. What are you going to collect? What are you going to anonymize? What are you going to um, uh, curate? What are you going to save? How are you going to um, audit those uh, results so that you have um, uh, real results that you know what's going on? And then there's another set of issues, right, which is um, what do you actually want to keep? Because uh, the chances of particularly once you're connected to an IoT platform broadly in a city, chances of getting hacked are, you know, reasonably high, frankly. And so uh, that says you may or may not keep a certain information. And then thirdly, you say well, there's another category, which is uh, 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 individuals in a city that need special information to do their job, say a child welfare worker who is investigating a problem of abuse. That's a different situation with a different set of rules with much more contour on it. So I think we're in the very early stages of this. Um, it will be important, I think, for leaders uh, to point out to their agencies, uh, here is the how-to manual about what you're supposed to keep. Even the process of what to make in terms of open data, there have been slip-ups because people think the open data is, not, is anonymized and it really isn't quite anonymized. So I think we have a long way to go. That, that happened in New York City um, a couple years ago. Um, um, Kyle, as you're implementing this new infrastructure, how are you incorporating or how are you trying to get ahead of this? Yeah, it's an interesting question because on one hand, we, we know there's real value in monitoring these systems, right? If we have um, artificial intelligence uh, tied into our, our street lights, and, and that can learn that there's a train coming into the station, and so any, anyone that's trying to go west out of our community shouldn't take that road because it'll create a traffic jam. That's valuable, right? Uh, but then there are points where you can go to the other end of the spectrum where you have the minority report, and you walk into the city, and it knows who you are, and it knows what you bought, and it, and it projects that. And so while we're trying to, to create this um, innovation lab, we're working with GE and MIT, to create this open source laboratory that can monitor uh, what's happening. We can, we can evaluate our sustainability objectives. Are we, are we decarbonizing on track? Are we reusing enough of the resources we have? Are we generating more? Are, is our traffic uh, flow getting more efficient, right? And then let, let it be open so that students, high school students, college students, innovators can come in, experiment, and create new ideas but at the same time, then we have to balance that open source against the very um, important goal of privacy and, and not projecting out to everyone things that, that should remain private forever. So one of the things that we're trying to do is innovate in the areas of law and governance around uh, the people that come in and what they can and can't do and create a set of rules now in some cases where we don't even know what the impacts are down the road. So some of it is known, some of it's not known, but we're trying to think ahead to what that minority report future that's just around the corner could you know could do to our you know our community we we hear this minority report 1984 thing quite a bit and i'll give you a very concrete example of work that the lab has done uh, within the sensible city lab we've recently in the past couple of years created an initiative where we are mining human sewage for information on urban health in near real time right we've created these sort of hopefully soon to be fully automated testing sampling systems that go into the sewers and they take samples in these sort of micro neighborhoods in Cambridge. Now, this is really interesting because it provides us insights on the city's health, uh, spread of viruses, bacteria, use of chemicals, et cetera, that they didn't have before. This could be very useful for citizens and for the government. However, once you start telling private citizens that, that's a complicated conversation. And now you have to be very clear that you're not interested, sorry to be very frank, in what somebody had for lunch, right? Like one individual, that you're interested in the aggregate, right? That you're interested in larger groups of people. One unexpected outcome of this research is that we spun it out into a company called Biobot, and we're working with local cities uh, because they're interested in understanding this data to get a better lens into the opioid crisis. 
to have an understanding of not just fatality deaths, but where are people actually using these drugs to help them allocate resources for the city better based on a new data stream. So we had uh, just one little anecdote. So we had a, uh, when I was in New York, we installed uh, wireless water meters, right? So we had a news conference because we wanted to show people uh, how they could better conserve water, right? Because now they had real-time water. And the, there was a city councilor there, and, and he agreed, and we used his water usage. And you could watch his water usage, and then one Wednesday afternoon, it spiked, right? You could see. And so the question was then, did you take an extra shower? Did you have a friend over at 3 o'clock on Wednesday afternoon? This is a very and he, and he looked at us, and he went, you can monitor that? Which was, well, yes, you can. Uh, so there's two sides to every one of these coins, right? You can do it for good, or you can do it for bad, and how you prevent people from kind of seeing things that they shouldn't see. Right, that's right. And then, and then, af, you know, what about when somebody else um, or takes control over the smarts of the, the smart city? I mean, we're, you know, the, in the wake of the Equifax data breach, um, I'm curious to hear about what kinds of conversations you're having about security, especially, you know, Kyle, as you're literally putting pipes into the ground and you're, and you're, beginning to build this infrastructure from the ground up. Yeah, so uh, the people that provide the sensors, the, the, um, the data collection devices, are all partnering with us now. GE is one example where we'll be installing sensors in literally a couple months in our street poles, but we're partnering with the service providers to make sure that we create as hacker-free environment as possible so that data is secure, so that we can get the best out of the technology without opening ourselves up to security breaches and things like that. So it's top of mind for us and our partners that the implementation is exciting, but it's, it's only truly beneficial if it's, if it's secure and well thought out. Steve, do you have any best practices that you've, um, or if you have any um, examples where this was implemented successfully or if it know, have lessons learned from some other cities. No, I don't. Because <laughs> uh, um, so, you've solved it already. Well, I think the, uh, the, the vendors are ahead of the cities, and then developers who are integrating the vendors are ahead of cities, because there aren't very many, if any, U.S. cities that have uh, truly integrated all of the sensors on a platform that allows them to to use them to manage what's happening. So I, I, we're at early stages of people thinking about it. And we know one interesting question you can even sense in this conversation is, do, do, does the audience trust the developer more than the city or the city more than developer? And you know, it's kind of 50-50. Like, uh, so I think what we would recommend to cities is store as little data as you, as you need to do your job and fortify your network because there's two risks here, right? One is the network comes down with a result on the utilities and, and, and everything else. And the other is that the information is exposed are both real risks. Right, Aaron, do you have anything to add on that? No, Steve nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanna talk about um, the failures um, and specifically what are the lessons um, that we can learn from them. Um, Steve, you're essentially creating a, a repository of best practices um, and I'm curious, where have you seen technology fail to solve a problem? Well, this assumes that technology, I mean, this kind of goes back to your original, assumes that technology can solve a problem in the, uh, just regardless of how capable the person is who's using the technology, which is kind of a false assumption. So I, I think you see failure where in, in, in my world of kind of government performance in two areas. One is where you're trying to solve the wrong problem, right? So the, somebody hasn't asked the right what if question and you're using technology to make an obsolete system work slightly more efficiently, right? So that's not very good. The other is where you have implemented some fancy piece of technology without any adequate consideration of the user's experience, whether the user is 
the person, the citizen, or whether the user is the public employee using the technology. So I think really what we're trying to get people to do is ask questions. How do we identify the outliers? What are the causes of these problems? How do we identify what will solve these problems? And then how do we create a system that will inform the public and the citizen about how to make better decisions? So I think the mistakes come when people assume the technology is going to make some uh, transformative change, but they haven't changed their actions or their questions. Can you give us just sort of a concrete example of that study? Well, uh, you know, we talked a little bit as we were coming in um, about uh, stormwater briefly, right? So uh, there are systems that will manage your wastewater plant more effectively. So if you take no steps to manage stormwater runoff, so you have massive amounts of water running into your plants, and then you're going to spend all your money making your plants run more efficiently, you solve the wrong problem, right? The problem is to keep the water from runoff from going into the oceans or the rivers. So you step back and go, okay, we're going to put sensors in the sewers. We're going to put sensors in where stormwater runs off. We're going to manage the flows, and we're going to solve the problem. So too often we run to the end, and, and we're making a system more efficient that's really managing the wrong thing. I'd like to add two parts to that. The first of which is that not every thing that is smart is necessarily an intelligent idea, right? So I point to this technology that's come out of Japan somewhere that's a smart diaper that alerts you to when your child's diaper needs to be changed because there's a sensor in it. Now, okay, that's a smart solution, but maybe like the analog version of a kid screaming and crying worked just fine and we could have spent our time and effort solving a more pressing issue. I think that that's one issue. A second is failures of when policy lag behind technology. And an example of this is, is now no longer as relevant, but uh, with drone technology. The drone technology for environmental sensing, whether it's air quality or traffic monitoring or water quality, was, uh, you know, was around five years ago. But the policy of actually flying things in urban spaces wasn't quite there. So we're just like sitting at the starting gate not able to actually do anything. Kyle. <laughs> I, I, have a, I have a problem with this question because uh, it's a good question. It's just that our ideals are a little bit different. So to us, uh, if, if we think about one of the goals being inclusivity, right? To give people of all socioeconomic uh, levels an opportunity to improve their lives and live in our city and coexist, right? I don't know how technology helps me do that. Access to education, um, job opportunities. I, I don't see the direct connection. So that to me would be, it fails to achieve that objective in, in, in our definition of making this smart city. Um, I don't know how, um, how a disabled person benefits. I don't know how um, we, we create diversity. I don't know how you measure happiness. There's no sensor that you can put on a light pole that we can track and say, our people are getting happier. They're leading more fulfilled lives. They've built bonds with folks that they normally wouldn't interact with from different races and, and, and backgrounds, and, and they're finding common ground, and they're feeling fulfilled and happy. I don't think technology can measure that. And so the things that we're going after at Union Point are striving to figure out how to measure that, and we don't know how to do it yet, but, but I don't think technology is the answer to everything, and so I think the failure of technology is that it isn't the answer to everything. It's an answer to some things. It's a tool in your toolbox to achieve some of the ideals, but not all of them. I would agree with that. Um, cities are emotional places, and you can't measure, well, I guess you can measure emotion, but you can't, it's difficult to do that with technology. I think we have some uh, time for questions. Hi. Um, Could you introduce you, yourself? Oh, Janice, Thank you. Janice Marconi, uh, Marconi Works International. And yes, I am related to Marconi, but low in the DNA food chain, paternal cousin side, but I do have the crazy gene. <laughs> okay? <laughs> okay. Um, a couple of years ago when I was uh, teaching a seminar over at the Naval War College, and it was particularly on EMF fields, and what I decided to use was, as an example, was um, 
coronal mass ejections. A lot of people think of those as solar flares, but basically it'll knock out anything electronic, okay? Because it was easier to design around that uh, without getting into details. The thing that I noticed was this. Um, I gave that as an example. Things can be knocked out. We don't have any methodology, very few, for hardening assets. You know, in other words, protecting it from a stroke. It's like, you know, when you, when you fry your electronics, it, it's, it's like your, your computer having a, a stroke. Uh, the other thing with transformers, you saw all the transformers being blown out in Florida because of Irma, and you saw the transformers being blown out in Puerto Rico. Uh, the only countries that really make on a large scale transformers are Russia, Brazil, and China. Is, is, is there a question mark yeah, at the, the end Yeah, the thing is, the... is that what are we doing? What, you know, we're talking about smart cities and the infrastructure, but we haven't, we have hospitals for making people better in healthcare, right? But we don't necessarily have ways of protecting that electronic digital infrastructure from not, we think hacking all the time, but there's other things that can blow transformers that can, can fry them and we can be in a Florida or Puerto Rico, not for two weeks, six months to a year. Okay. Thank you, thank you for your question. Kyle has something to add. Yeah, so um, for part of what you're saying, our, our friends at GE have come to us with an idea. We happen to have the good fortune to have a, a gas line, a high pressure gas line on our property. So we can create redundant energy that goes into our microgrid, and we can just keep it for ourselves so that our robotics companies, and they have power all the time. But our friends at GE have suggested that we maybe look at this from a more benevolent standpoint and take lessons from Puerto Rico and Florida and think about the surrounding communities and extend an electrical network back out to them so that if we should have a prolonged storm or something, which happens here in New England, uh, that, that we could provide power to the, the hospital and the police and fire stations, senior centers, a grocery store, right, should they happen to run out of power. So I think that if you care about this stuff and you're thinking about it and you've got good partners, there are opportunities to solve some of these things, not everything, but, but we at Union Point are actually looking for solutions to potential issues like that. I, I liked the part of your question where you compared it to health and hospitals because there's something that we're doing in our lab to try to understand like preventative health of infrastructure, but hard infrastructure in a city, not the electronic side and the data side that you're talking about, but understanding the structural integrity of bridges. So think about all the bridges in Massachusetts uh, that cross the uh, Charles River, for example, the salt and pepper bridge that's gonna be under construction for I'm not sure quite how long and I'm not sure for quite how much money. But, I think that there's ways to measure the health of bridges and infrastructure in very simple ways. There's a project that we're doing in the lab where we're measuring bridge vibra vibrations just with iPhones, just using the same simple accelerometer that's built into your iPhone already. And we had a researcher who drove back and forth over the Golden Gate Bridge a hundred times just to find out, are those vibrations the same that you get out of your simple smartphone that they are at a multi-thousand dollar piece of equipment? So that leads us to say that we can understand day to day to day when a bridge might be ready to fail. So we get to it before we have a massive project that costs hundreds of millions of dollars. Dave, do you have anything you want to add on that? Thank you for your question. Emily, we have a question over here. Right. From The Guardian to the Harvard Business Review, there have been recent articles on the epidemic of loneliness. Can you say what each of your initiatives are doing to track that phenomena and possibly create solutions, and what can we do to help? I believe the question is, yeah. what can citizens so, do to uh, help? At Union Point, one of the reasons we're here is because so many smart people are located right up the street at the great universities here. We wanted the... Um, the university system to know that we are a living laboratory, an urban laboratory. So for us, it's an appeal to people researching all of these areas to come work with us as partners. And so if, if someone has an idea on how to measure happiness, for example, we want to hear about that. We want to experiment with that and see if, if we can actually influence that and what can we do that would drive happiness in the community? So if, if folks are, are investigating this, we would love 
to, uh, to partner with you. The city of Dubai is doing that. They've got a minister of happiness whose job it is they want Dubai to be the happiest city on earth. And that's when you go to the Smart Dubai website, that's one of the first things that, that pops up. It's a major thruster of their research and activities. Do you know how they measure that? <laughs> I don't. They may. Okay, well, let's uh, ask the city of Boston. Maybe it's time to get one over Maybe here. Maybe Nigel knows. <laughs> I met the Minister of Happiness in Dubai. He's really happy. <laughs> and he's actually written a whole book about what he's doing. So question here. Thank you. Uh, Julia McElhinney, I'm an urban planner. And I just had a quick question about how we kind of look at policies and how they're working together to implement this smart infrastructure in existing cities. So I think Union Point's a great example because it's a new development, but it also means that then it's a real blank slate and you have largely a single landowner, so it's a lot easier to test a lot of these new smart technologies. But when we're trying to implement them into large cities with many different owners and existing infrastructure, how do we work with the cities to do that effectively and quickly so that we keep up with technology as it evolves? All right, so um, here's an example of how what we're doing could be beneficial to the city of Boston, for example. So let's say that we're they're thinking about an autonomous vehicle that can be summoned by a person in a wheelchair to get them to work. Uh, we can beta test bus stops, different ways that they could enter and exit and, and figure out how a blind person could find that spot. And right. So we can work through that block by block and try different systems in the same street and then take what we learn and share it so that the perfected, not the perfect, but a, an improved version might be applicable to Boston so that Boston doesn't have to repeat all of those same steps over years that, that we could move that thought process forward. That would be, that's the approach we're trying to take, is to, to beta test and then share that data in the hope that it's helpful to others. I have to admit that there's a, there's a really serious echo up here and I'm having trouble hearing the question. I can hear the question like three or four times at a time, so it's very difficult to discern it. But, you know, I, I, if I heard the question correctly, and that's, I apologize if I did. Another way to think about this is um, cities across the country, and of course Boston's a leading city, are thinking about how to use data to improve the way they operate. That means that as a city is looking at its homeless data, right, and then trying to figure out the efficacy of certain treatments for certain individuals. Now, every city is different, but to the extent that we can, you know, share uh, the algorithms and what are the data sets, that we can understand the biases that are in the data, right, and then and learn across those cities. We have, uh, in our program at Harvard, we have 20-some uh, uh, chief data officers who benefit by sharing those stories. So I, we have a long way to go in trying to figure out what to do with all this data and sharing it across the cities will accelerate, accelerate its utility. Do we have any more questions? Hi, Libby Wayman from GE. Have the great pleasure of working with Union Point on some of their outcomes. But I'm curious, what are the main outcomes that many cities are trying to drive? Is it very custom for different cities around the world? Or are there a few that are um, kind of common across them, such that if Union Point figures them out, they can be rolled out effectively really around the world? Right. I guess the question is how scalable are some of these uh, solutions? Thank you. Um, so as we were discussing earlier, uh, Kyle's point is correct that what works in Seoul might not work in Boston, might not work in Mexico City, but the aim is that your solutions are at least flexible enough to be transferable. A project that we're working on with the city of Amsterdam is trying to create a fleet of autonomous boats that will go up and down the canals of Amsterdam to transport goods and people to do sensing in the city in new ways. And that's interesting because everybody's talking about autonomous driving hitting your roadways. But what happens when your roadways are actually made of water? Right? How do you take the technology that already exists, the, predi the predictive navigation, the navigation algorithms, and switch it into a more water-based environment? 
And that's not just something that's going to work in Amsterdam that has a thousand kilometers of canal ways and 1,500 bridges, but could work around other coastal cities around the world uh, and allowing them to do, again, uh, more creative transfer of goods and people and also environmental sensing in their cities. So I think you're the answer to this question. Uh, so you're, you have a lot more customers than my city does, right? And you're, uh, you know, the, you're learning across those customers with your research labs. Uh, you know, when I was mayor of Indianapolis, I outsourced my wastewater plant management to a large French company. And my employees were really good, but they were better because they had more PhDs than I had employees, right? So not more PhDs than I had PhDs, more PhDs than I had employees in my water plant, right? So to, to, uh, one way to think about the scale issue, it, particularly in a cloud-based environment, is how you're going to provide your insights to a city, and then what does a city want to control with respect to you as the vendor? So we can think about you as kind of the answer to scale. Another way to think about scale is um, what is the city's responsibility to, uh, right, because um, every internet provider doesn't have to provide services to every community. So a, a, a way to think about scale also is scale inside a city. So how do I redistribute the income I make from my light pole parking system in downtown Boston to a, a neighborhood in Boston that would not normally have high-speed internet? So I think the scale issue is very interesting, and, and if we think about it broadly, there'll be uh, solutions that were really not possible before. I think we have time for one more question. One more, one more question. Hi, uh, Jim Sprawl, and I'm an advocate for autonomous vehicle driving in the cities, but I wanted to get your perspective on the relationship between federal, state, and local governments. Who should, be, I should probably just be better off yelling, I would think, but <laughs> is it, who should take the leadership role? Should it be a partnership? Should the cities and state wait for federal legislation before we start to enact uh, the technology and start to take advantage of what autonomy has to offer in the smart cities? So I think the question is, what is the relationship between city government and state and federal to coordinate uh, policies around are you start talking specifically about autonomous vehicles? You can answer for autonomous vehicles. Yes, I'll just exactly. say <laughs> everything should start local. It's much more likely to happen if it does. Yeah, I, I would agree with that 100%, but that also means that like starting local means citizens and explaining to your 75-year-old woman who's never driven a car, how this is gonna work so that you get people on board and they're not actually terrified of what autonomous driving looks like. But the cities and the infrastructure folks absolutely need to be involved as we're moving through the you know, sort of multimodal, what happens when he's in an autonomous car and I'm driving myself? What does that mean for stoplights, traffic lights, intersections? Um, what does it mean for insurance, right? So there's all sorts of parties that need to be around the table, but that table, as Steve mentioned, need, needs to start very locally. Yep, I think that's a very complicated, uh, complicated question. Do you have anything to add, Steve? No. Kyle. Thank you, everybody.